Hello and welcome to Running Free Skills. My name is Esther Coleman Hawkins and here with me but not near me is Denise Erickson. Together we are media mentors and our mission is to help creatives create. Thank you to Acme for broadcasting these sessions. You can join the conversation at hashtag running free skills. Um, right now it's over to Denise in the spare bedroom studio. Denise. See ya. In this session, I'm going to talk to Alex West. He's one of Australia's top documentary makers and particularly skilled at really interesting visual storytelling. And he's on standby right now. Can you hear me okay? I can't hear you now. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, all good. Right, I will. Should we rock this little puppy? Good. So, this session, what makes a great documentary story? And the, who better to talk to us about that than Alex West, who joins us now? Hello, Alex. Hi, how are you, Denise? Oh, going well, going well. <laughs> New ventures all around with these things. So tell me, give me a potted history of your career. What have you, I mean, when did you start making documentaries? How did you get into it? Well, I got into it in the 1980s, which is terrifying, but uh, um, in terms of the time. Um, 1980s, I was always fascinated by uh, human history, by human beings, by human behaviour. I did a degree in anthropology, a degree in archaeology, and I joined the BBC, who at that time would take on people with degrees in specialist subjects uh, in program making departments who specialised in making TV documentaries about those subjects. Um, so that from the get go put me into this kind of category of specialist factual programmes. Um, having got a grounding um, as a student, I made my first film independently and then joined the BBC. I then went on a kind of trajectory uh, through uh, independent production in the UK, the US, and then latterly um, in Australia. And so I've always, I guess what I would say is that I've always had a mission to explain. Um, and what I mean by that is, a, is a, to explain and have a window on the human condition. Uh, how we got to now, what makes us who we are, why things are the way they are. Um, and that's involved me with doing quite a lot of um, work with subjects like history. But equally, um, you know, the human dimension to these stories is, is really um, uh, critical and central. Otherwise, you're just kind of illustrating a lecture, essentially, and that's not a film. So over the years, I've learned about how to combine compelling human stories with with uh, kind of overarching narratives about stuff whatever stuff may be but generally issues politics culture arts history etc i'm curious to know what was the first film you made before you got into the bbc what was it about the first film i ever made was called the strength of these arms black labor white rice which is an unwieldy title but it was a half an hour documentary about the work that archaeologists were doing uncovering the settlements and life ways of slaves in the uh, old south pre-civil war which is a subject no one had really ever known about or considered that there were in early america there were millions of africans obviously who'd been transported against their will enslaved and brought to the southern us and the caribbean <coughs> excuse me and um by the late 80s, there was a growing amount of scientific work on how those people existed, lived within the plantation system. Um, and we were doing work. I was doing that work for my master's degree. And I had this kind of lightning rod moment that this story about the early experience of slavery for black Americans was too important to stay in academic uh, journals and lectures for a very small specialized audience. And at that moment, I decided, it kind of came to me in a kind of flash that a film should be made about this work. And so I set about making a film. I didn't know anything. I didn't know Jack about making films at that point. And, um, but I had, and it's quite interesting given the subject of this conversation, it's, I had, I realized I had a story 
And it was a very compelling and important story that needed to be told. And at that point, I kind of gathered together the resources I needed um, to tell that story. And, and, and interestingly enough, the, 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 the link was the BBC in London saw that film and then um, I started working for them as a result of it. So I had this story I'd already made and they were interested. And we remade that film for the BBC, um, bigger, better. And so it started as my little film, became a big film for them. So, I mean, I guess in a way, a lot of people listening and watching to this will have their little one-liners, their characters they've met, the stories that they'd like to tell. But yeah. very few of them transfer into compelling documentaries. Why is that? Well, I think that there are several reasons for that. Um, the first is that your story has to be inherently relevant and compelling. And, of course, many stories are because events are always shifting and growing and what we're interested in as a culture and what our attention is on uh, constantly mutates. So generally people choose things that um, are of relevance. I, I rarely see a film that's completely of zero relevance, but, uh, but then the problem fits in. And I think that the first thing I'd say is that I often get pitched and often discuss what are essentially sequences with um, with uh, uh, filmmakers, documentary makers. They're a small part of a bigger whole and they can see one thing, um, one element, but they, uh, the other elements of the story are invisible to them. And I always come back to this thing about narrative surface area, narrative density. You need a lot going on in a film. It's not enough to take, um, it's not enough to kind of take one person to one event. You have to get a bigger context you have to get a, a larger framework. Uh, I'm currently developing a film about someone who's about to go through gender reassignment surgery. Um, and I'm looking at that quite carefully and making judgments about whether or not the fact that just filming them and the surgery is enough. I don't actually think it is, even though that's of great interest and the character is really powerful and the issues are really relevant. More, uh, at one crude level, more stuff needs to happen in the film and I'm thinking about what that needs to be because the film needs to have a developing arc and if you've got enough pieces you can start to rearrange them you can you can build a story that's more compelling and like anything with greater density you can go from one thing to the other and back and you can build a structure and a story that's just that's just better it's more interesting so using that example, how would, you, um, how would you build that into a more compelling story? What other characters do you see coming in? Well, how do you construct events, I guess, to make this yeah. an interesting film? Well, I mean, this is the thing about factual and documentary. You, the, the issue of constructing events is often uh, where people get, get confused. I mean, there are, there are shades of opinion from one never touches events that you literally you know, the fly on the wall, observing, not, um, not getting involved with any behaviour at all. But for the vast majority of films, uh, you are, like it or not, uh, a constructor of a story. Um, By your very presence, really, isn't it? I mean, the minute you introduce yeah. camera, it changes the dynamic. It can't be any different. Uh, yeah. yeah, and it's as authored as a feature film. I mean, I think that people have this, slightly misplaced thing that documentary has a kind of purity and of course in essence it does but what is the truth from the pure what is the purity well it's about having the filmmaker allow the story to unfold but keeping an extremely tight rein on the on the steering wheel and having a roadmap as to where it's going to go so when you ask me about the kind of characters about it it would seem to me that it's pretty um it's it's it's, pr it's pretty necessary if, if a if a person who is currently a man is about to get gender reassigned to be a woman that um his wife or partner female partner his children should he have them a part of this too and his circle of family and friends are part of this too going outwards i, I often see these things like concentric rings who are the must-have characters um and again, you can almost apply a drama thing. I mean, who is the, who's the sidekick character? 
who's the romantic uh, uh, character, who's the supporting actor in this narrative. And of course, with a documentary, you don't know that at the beginning, but you have to do a lot of legwork to line up those characters. So in a, in a piece like that, you know, I have to spend a great deal of time with uh, the subject's ex-wife to persuade her to be involved. For I mean, for obvious reasons, it's not. That's not. A, yeah, sure, I'll do it. That's a that's a job of work. So I do that kind of work intensely prior to the construction of the story because without that, I'm missing a huge story block. I don't know how those story trajectories are going to play out, but I know I need to be filming them in order to be. Um, in order to have the raw material in the edit. So what you're actually saying too is that you, you can't just... I, I, I mentor so many people who think that you can just go out and have a squirt and, with some film and tape and cameras and yeah. bring yeah. back something that can work. Well, you can't, no, can you? No. I've worked on the film I just described to you for several months now. I haven't shot anything and I wouldn't because that's like, it's always a waste. And people, I think partly the structure of funding in Australia tries to encourage people to shoot sizzle reels, et cetera, and so forth. Um, I tend to um, refuse to do that, actually, because it's a waste of time and energy at some level. Um, so, yeah, just squirting is the, and, you know, it's never been easier. When I started, you needed a 16 millimeter camera and a crew and all the rest of it. So it was, a, it was it kind of didn't happen off the, it wasn't a kind of it wasn't something that one could do on one's own particularly although it did happen um now of course cameras are incredibly democratic and that's a great thing and a good thing but just filming stuff um has to be fitted in now of course this being documentary and factual stuff happens and good films are made by people seeing an action um and going and filming it but generally when they do they're aware of a bigger context and they understand that the events they're filming have a meaning beyond simply the events. And hopefully when that's happening, they're filming in a certain way, they're asking certain questions, um, and they're, they're understanding that they're, what they're doing is gonna fit into something that they've already, to some extent, uh, hopefully a large extent, researched and structured. I mean, I, I can never, ever, ever underestimate the power of research, you know? That is such a huge starting point. It's one that's so neglected. One of the other things that's often neglected, of course, and it's, you know, getting to the nitty gritty of it all now for people who are watching this. You know, the, the, the audience in this is crucial. And so often you see ideas, certainly I've been pitched ideas over the years that are not at all about an audience. The audience is completely forgotten, really. So how do you approach considering the audience and in, in building the films you want to make? Well, uh, I don't make any films that I don't consider the audience for, um, because first and foremost, mm -hmm. I see myself as a, uh, as a viewer. And so if I'm like, am I interested in this? Um, what would I need out of this as a, as a, as a viewer? I, I have to ask myself some really hard questions. And the, the first question, if I'm interested in something, I ask the, why would anyone give a damn about this? I really ask a hard question like, well, I might be into whatever, archeology, span slavery, but why would anyone else be? And the job I have to do as a filmmaker is to make uh, people give a damn about it. So then I'm gonna bring all the tools and techniques to bear to, to do that. So audience is critical. And I think it, it, rely, it, it goes to another thing which is, very rarely, if ever, mentioned with documentaries. What constitutes a valid state, a valid story for an audience has at some level to uh, have some journalism in it. Um, and often, I think increasingly over the years, documentary making as such and journalism as such has kind of gone on very separate paths. But I, I think that journalism in the sense of uh, analysis and balance and fact finding and interview and following a trail to uncover uh, a story or an issue on behalf of a reader or a viewer gets lost in the mix. It's very often I say I'm I'm a 
you know, people self-identify as documentary makers. They're interested in a thing. They have lots of opinions about that thing. And off they go to essentially do their thing. And it's kind of a self-indulgent process and often falls into the pitfalls as well. I, I never cared to begin with. And you've not, you've not actually done what you need to do, which is to bring me with you. And so you fundamentally kind of disrespect me as a viewer. Just how do you, you think it's cool. How do yeah. you assess whether there's an audience for, for what you want to make? How, how do you make that decision? Well, I don't in a crude sense of how many millions of viewers on television, for example, this might uh, get. I think it's a, it's, a, it's a more intimate thing. I mean, once you apply journalism to it, uh, it becomes... Uh, there have become a series of kind of key questions which are kind of like this conversation started why is it happening what is it what are the viewpoints on it um uh, where will it go how might it unfold what are the precedents what do we know so far where's the science or whatever background if you're doing that kind of thing but even on a human level even an intimate human portrait you kind of ask have to ask the, the, the same thing so the the kind of wash up of that means that you're 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 constantly um, asking those hard questions about is the story of, of validity. I think it's I I don't I mean stories don't on, on the basis that you have to make an audience uh, help them to understand it. You are not going this is going to get a great audience, big audience necessarily. And actually, I've always worked in the obscure thing. My thing on this mission to explain has been to say this is extraordinary. I now need to be the translator to the person watching the screen to get and enable them to see how extraordinary it is. So I'm a cipher because the story is inherently wonderful. Um, I made a film last year about uh, how scientists discovered um, the, the structure of, of existence and life in terms of ecology. Very arcane science film um, played in, as a feature length in cinemas. And it's... Uh, the fact is that the story was so important because it was enabled us to see how we can heal the planet, but that alone made it worthy of making. But it was only then that we could make something that needed to be of impact on the viewer. And so there was a kind of clarion call, and often they are, but it's all, you can, you can have any number of things that you care deeply about and wish to kind of um, communicate, but if you then don't do it in a manner that can bring the audience with you, it's going to fail. So for those of us who haven't actually seen that film, um, how did you approach such an arcane subject and bring it to audience relevance? Well, good question. The film's called The Serengeti Rules, meaning R-U-L-E-S, the rules being these rules of ecology of how ecosystems work. Essentially, we the first thing is it's a human story. It's a story of five scientists and the work that they did over 50 years to fit the pieces of the puzzle together. And so each scientist who's now a, a, an elderly person looks back over their career. We shot a lot of uh, drama reconstructions to a very high standard where they described their work and the discoveries they made, which were amazing, but they were amazing because the, the way that we shot the reconstructions really uh, focused on, on that and with a highly visual. Um, we had um, a, a journalist who we filmed in a, in a constructed set, but it looked like a kind of science area, completely built by the production, who acted as the, the narrator, but was a character in the film, the person who asked the questions uh, about these, these things, um, these people, their stories. So we did a bunch of techniques to bring it to life. So it's almost approaching it as a feature drama as opposed to a feature doco with recreations and using all of the, as you said before when we spoke before the interview, yeah. the glorious techniques that are available to you. Um, yeah. Tell us about, you, you said swim in gorgeousness with the phrase that's yeah. out. What do yeah. you mean by swimming in gorgeousness? What, tell me about well, It's a film. You know, ah. uh, so films, films. Uh, I mean, films are beautiful. When we watch them, we're looking at a kind of living, moving art. Whether it's the power of the human face on a, and you know, often and even domestically projected on a big, flat screen, um, 
it's incredible. I mean, uh, even when I see a fairly rough trailer, the fact that it's big and, you know, you're in a close up and you're hearing the person's heartfelt feelings chimes emotionally. So it doesn't have to be really, um, it's not that it's about being incredibly kind of spectacular with massive special effects, although all of that helps in the kind of crowded marketplace. It's that we are, <clears throat> we are working in an inherently visual medium. And I, I, I sometimes see films that I describe as radio because they're, 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 they've kind of forgotten that or never kind of understood that. And so all of these things have fit together, a bit like the Bushkas, one, one circle is inside the other. So the thing about narrative surface area, um, you might have a, a, a slice of uh, high adventure action, essentially, you know, it's what might be the equivalent of a car chase scene, um, something that moves these different rhythms and paces. And while it can be filmed rough and ready, and often it's good to film it rough and ready because it has immediacy, um, mixing and matching and knowing that, if you like, the visual function of sequences is really important. So I'm always looking for, I mean, I make a lot of films about arcane, boring stuff, and I'm always looking. And I think it's because I began my career making films about archaeology in which nothing moves and everything's dead. And it's literally people are digging a brick out of the ground. And that's what you see. And therefore, how to make it move how to make it dramatic. I, I had to solve those problems from the very get-go. And I think whenever I look at something, I go, there's a visual, there's a, there's a sequence, there's a moment. And I also think um, uh, I, I'm making a film, hopefully right now, about the Constitution, which is a 44-page document, uh, uh, document that's fading, tied up with a red ribbon and covered in curly writing very dull, doesn't move, it's dead. But when I start thinking about some of the things in that, I go, oh, we could take a helicopter here and winch someone down there and have some fun with that. And it would be high speed because I'm thinking about the visual symbolism of things as well and what you might do. So you get a, you know, you develop a, a kind of muscle for that. Um, but beautifully crafted doesn't mean all incredibly expensive and gorgeous, but there's a, there's, there's a different mate, different types of gorgeousness, but bottom line, it has to be visual. So or else it's radio. I guess in summary, what we're sort of saying to people here is you're, test your ideas with fantastic research. Yeah. Ensure that you've got a really, you know, strong interest from your audience and be considering why your audience would want to watch it. <sighs> then use every visual, you know, arsenal in your head and everywhere else to try and bring the story alive. And that, you know, that's a sort of basic three steps, isn't it? Well, I, I, I'd say it's not on the one about audience. It's not that ensure that you've got a strong audience interest. It's like, I go the opposite way and say, assume there's zero interest. <laughs> I mean, there's documentaries are incredibly hard in the market. No one gives a damn, right? In the, against the wall of entertainment and so on. And so if you look closely at documentaries and why, you need to look at them and go, why am I giving a damn within like the first 15 or 20 seconds? What, what is it that's happening here in front of me that's making me stay? Um, and um, so I assume that audiences don't give a damn. And then from the very first frame, I have to make them, I have to start this process where I'm gonna, I'm gonna give them a gift. I'm gonna give them this extraordinary story, which they're gonna come at the end of and go, oh my God, that was incredible. And, and, and finally, they're not gonna notice that I did that. Actually, it's weaving a kind of magic that, not to manipulate people, but you've got to get out of your own way as a filmmaker, uh, and that is, you know, uh, uh, I, I, I see a lot of people who have lots of opinions and ideas about a thing they want to make a film, and they're kind of in their own way. They have to get out of it and let the story flow through them. But as I said earlier, you've got to be the, the if you like, the ringleader and the, and the architect of it. And the conduit for it, really, isn't exactly, it? Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So I'm, what I'm saying, the people watching this will have to do as a result or should think about doing while, what, after watching this is test their ideas against those premises that you're describing, aren't you? Yeah, 
yeah, yeah, yeah. And and every idea has to, it is does every idea has to be well researched. I mean, that's the number one, isn't it? Oh, totally. Because otherwise, we we are. These are facts, and facts are critically important. And this is the journalism side of it. Um, we have to fact check. We have to know. Um, we have to understand and we have to recheck and re-understand and without that you can't without that map you can't actually steer the car it's not it's not actually appropriate for you to because you're gonna essentially uh drive it in, in a direction that may mislead your audience uh, bottom line so that's critical and of course it's only within doing that research deeper that you can understand where the story needs to go um, and the hard work you have to do to access it because it's not always there on the plate many people come with films because they may know someone who something has happened to and it's like you know it, like it's like access, access is the hardest thing if you need to in, break into i don't mean literally but um you know if you need to uh, get inside an institution that can take months years to do you have to know why you're doing it and so forth yeah you know? cool well, I, you know, to end up, I want to know what you're watching at the moment. What's pushing your buttons? What What are you loving? <laughs> um, kind of embarrassingly, because my daughter's 11, Glee, actually, <laughs> watching reruns of Glee. And uh, Glee is superb, but also... Um, Why is it Sarah, superb? What, 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 what engages you about it? Uh, well, A, the music, but 10 years plus. It's inc incredibly incredibly groundbreaking uh, prime time entertainment product dealing with diversity. I mean, it, it's like it, through the lens of 2020, it tries so, so hard to be diverse and it succeeds. And it's the actual, the, 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 the life lessons that it's imparting to my 11 year old are really good. And so it's entertaining, it's dramatic. All these characters are facing the crosses to bear there's gender, there's sexuality, there's disability, there's race, there's everything in there. Um, and it's in this beautifully sweet comedic package with all these great songs. And um, so it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of perfectly formed piece of prime time. Um, you know, it's not what you call a high fiber diet, but that's okay. Um, we need a bit of variety. So I'm watching that and, and, and also Sarah Ferguson's expose of Catholic church abuse, which we talked about yesterday is just... It's stunning, isn't it? it it's, well, it's interesting. Yes, it's stunning. And it's actually opposite of this conversation. What Sarah Ferguson does is that first and foremost, she's a journalist. So she is interrogating facts at a deep level. The second thing as a documentary maker, um, and she's now blending those two roles, is... Um, it's about access and it's a it's watched really carefully about how the narrative is crafted at some levels it's still a very it's a basic factual unfolding chronological event but it's got lots of good um elements of documentary in there and of course the compelling power of the human face it doesn't have to be visually uh, incredibly strong because the the um the story alone makes it happen so that's in the doco space and of course excuse me it's an incredibly important and incredibly necessary and it does what documentary and factual television does best of all which is it it, uh, it it takes these things which are of issue and it puts them in our faces and unequivocally tells us the rights and wrongs of the of the situation so that in fact the society is never the same again you know if you watch that series you'll never view catholic church abuse and the role of the church and this paedophilia again in the same way. And in terms of watching a three hour long hit, and it's pretty harrowing, obviously, all the news and spin and politics around it just washes away because that's the human reality of the cost of what these men did to those children. And, uh, and that's the power of it. And she's a brilliant, brilliant journalist, first and foremost. Mm. And a perfect way to end the, our, our chat talking about a brilliant piece of documentary making so thank you so much for your time, you. alex it's been great and i'd also okay. like to say a big thank you to acme who's done a fantastic job on pulling this series together do make sure you tell all of your friends about this because it will live on the acme youtube channel for in perpetuity we hope and sign up for our um, newsletter on mediamentors.com.au 
Thank you very much, Alex, and see you all next time. Thank you very much, Denise. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. That was gorgeous. Cool. No worries. Excellent. Love, love your work. I'll just uh, turn off. All right, we'll talk soon, yeah? Yeah, we will. Thanks a lot. Take care. Take care. See you. Bye.